Dispossession, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 2 by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 12, Side 2. Daughter of Alfonso IX of Castile, granddaughter of Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine, Blanche lived up to her royal blood. She was a woman of beauty and charm, energy, character, and skill. At the same time, she impressed her age by her untarnished virtue as wife and widow, and her devotion as the mother of eleven children. France honored her not only as Blanche la Bonne Reine, but equally as Blanche la Bonne Mère. She freed many serfs on the royal estates, spent great sums on charity, and provided dowries for girls whose poverty discouraged love. She helped to finance the building of Chartres Cathedral, and it was through her influence that its stained glass showed Mary not as virgin but as queen. She loved her son Louis too jealously and was ungenerous to his wife. She trained him sedulously to Christian virtue and told him that she would rather see him dead than have him commit a mortal sin, but it was not her doing that he became a devotee. She herself rarely sacrificed policy to sentiment. She joined in the cruel Albigensian crusade to extend the power of the crown in southern France. For nine years, from 1226 to 1235, while Louis grew up, she governed the realm, and seldom has France been better ruled. At the outset of her regency the barons revolted, thinking to recapture from a woman the powers they had lost to Philip II. She overcame them with wise and patient diplomacy. She resisted England ably, and then signed a truce on just terms. When Louis the Ninth came of age and assumed the government, he inherited a kingdom powerful, prosperous, and at peace. He was a handsome lad, taller by a head than most of his knights, with finely cut features, clear skin, and rich blond hair, elegant in tastes, fond of luxurious furniture and colorful clothes, no bookworm but given to hunting and falconry, amusements and athletic games, not yet a saint, for a monk complained to Blanche of the royal flirtations. She found him a wife, and he settled down. He became a model of conjugal fidelity and parental energy. He had eleven children, and took an intimate share in their education. Gradually he abandoned luxury, lived more and more simply, and consumed himself in government, charity, and piety. He had a kingly conception of monarchy as an organ of national unity and continuity, and as a protection of the poor and weak against the superior or fortunate few. He respected the rights of the nobles, encouraged them to fulfill their obligations to serfs and vassals and suzerain, but would brook no feudal infringements of the new royal power. He interfered resolutely to repress injustices of lord to man, and in several cases severely punished barons who had executed men without due trial. When Enguerrand de Coucy hanged three Flemish students for killing some rabbits on his estate, Louis had him locked up in the tower of the Louvre, threatened to hang him, and released him on condition that he build three chapels where masses were to be said daily for his victims that he give the forest where the young scholars had hunted to the Abbey of St. Nicholas, that he lose on his estates the rights of jurisdiction and hunting, that he serve three years in Palestine, and pay the king a fine of twelve thousand five hundred pounds. Louis forbade feud vengeance and private feudal war, and condemned the judicial duel. As trial by evidence replaced trial by combat, the baronial courts were progressively superseded by the royal courts organized in each locality by the bailiffs of the king. The right of appeal from baronial judges to the central royal court was established. And in France, as in England, the thirteenth century saw a feudal law give way to a common law of the realm. Never since Roman days had France enjoyed such security and prosperity. In this reign, the wealth of France sufficed to bring Gothic architecture to its greatest abundance and perfection. He believed and proved that a government could be just and generous in its foreign relations without losing prestige and power. He avoided war as long as possible, but when aggression threatened, he organized his armies efficiently, planned his campaigns, and, in Europe, carried them through with energy and skill to an honorable peace that left no passion for revenge. As soon as the safety of France was assured, he adopted a policy of conciliation which accepted the compromise of opposed rights while rejecting the appeasement of unjust claims. He restored to England and Spain territory that his predecessors had seized. His counselors mourned, but peace endured and France remained free from attack even during the long absences of Louis on crusades. Men feared him, said William of Chartres, because they knew that he was just. From 1243 to 1270, France waged no war against a Christian foe. When her neighbors fought one another, Louis labored to reconcile them, scorning the suggestion of his council that such strife should be fomented to weaken potential enemies. Foreign kings submitted their disputes to his arbitration. 
people marveled that so good a man should be so good a king. He was not that perfect monster whom the world ne'er knew, the completely faultless man. He was occasionally irritable, perhaps through ill health. The simplicity of his soul sometimes verged upon culpable ignorance or credulity, as in the ill-conceived crusades and maladroit campaigns in Egypt and Tunisia, where he lost many lives besides his own. And though he was honest with his Moslem enemies, he could not apply to them the same generous understanding that had succeeded so well with his Christian foes. His childlike certitude of belief led him to a religious intolerance that helped to establish the Inquisition in France, and it quieted his natural pity for the victims of the Albigensian Crusade. His treasury was swelled by confiscating the goods of condemned heretics, and his usual good humor failed him toward the French Jews. But with these deductions he came nobly close to the Christian ideal. On no day of my life, reports Ranvi, did I ever hear him speak evil of anyone. When his Moslem captors accepted by mistake a sum of ten thousand livres, or two million dollars, short of the ransom promised for his release, Louis, restored safely to freedom, sent to the Saracens the additional payment in full, to the disgust of his counselors. Before leaving on his first crusade he bade his officials, through his realm, to receive in writing and to examine the grievances that may be brought against us or our ancestors, as also allegations of injustices or exactions of which our bailiffs, provosts, foresters, sergeants, or their subordinates may have been guilty. Oft times, says Juan V., he would go after Mass and seat himself against a tree in the wood of Vincennes, and make us sit around him, and all those who had any cause in hand came and spoke to him without hindrance or usher. He would settle some cases himself and turn others over to the counselors seated about him, but he gave each pleader the right of appeal to the king. He founded and endowed hospitals, asylums, monasteries, hospices, a home for the blind, and another, the Fille Dieu, for redeemed prostitutes. He ordered his agents in each province to search out the old and poor and provide for them at public expense. Wherever he went he made it a principle to feed, every day, one hundred twenty-four people. He had three of them join him for dinner, served them himself, and washed their feet. Like Henry III of England, he waited on lepers and fed them with his own hands. When famine struck Normandy, he spent an enormous sum getting food to the needy there. He gave alms daily to the sick, the poor, widows, women in confinement, prostitutes, disabled working men, so that hardly it would be possible to number his alms. Nor were these acts of charity spoiled by publicity. The poor whose feet he washed were chosen from the blind, the act was done in private, and the recipients were not told that their attendant was the king. His ascetic self-lacerations were unknown to others until revealed on his flesh after his death. In the campaign of 1242, he contracted malaria in the marshy regions of Saint-Ange. It brought on pernicious anemia, and in 1244 he was near death. Perhaps such experiences turned him more and more to religion. Indeed, it was on recovering from that illness that he took the oath to crusade. He weakened himself with ascetic self-mortification. When he returned from his first crusade, aged only thirty-eight, he was already bent and bald, and nothing remained of his youthful beauty except the radiant grace of his simple faith and good will. He wore a hair shirt under a monk's brown robe, and had himself scourged with little iron chains. He loved the new monastic orders, Franciscans and Dominicans, gave to them without stint, and was with difficulty dissuaded from himself becoming a Franciscan. He heard two masses daily, recited the canonical prayers of Tiers, Sext, None, Vespers, and Compline, said fifty Ave Marias before retiring, and rose at midnight to join the priests at Matins in the chapel. He abstained from marital intercourse in Advent and Lent. Most of his subjects smiled at his devotions and called him Brother Louis. One bold woman told him, It would be better that another should be king in your place, for you are only king of the Franciscans and the Dominicans. It is an outrage that you should be king of France. It is a great marvel that they don't put you out. Louis replied, You tell the truth. I am not worthy to be king. And if it had pleased our Saviour, another would have been in my place, who would have known better how to govern the kingdom. He shared with enthusiasm in the superstitions of his time. The Abbey of Saint-Denis claimed to have a nail from the true cross. One day the nail was mislaid after its ceremonial exhibition to the people. A great furor arose. The nail was found, and the king was much relieved. I had rather, he said, that the best city in my kingdom had been swallowed up. In 1236 Baldwin II of Constantinople, appealing for funds to rescue his ailing state, sold to Louis for eleven thousand livres, or two point two million dollars, the crown of thorns worn by Jesus during his passion. Five years later Louis bought from the same auctioneer a piece of the true cross. 
Possibly these purchases were intended as grants in aid to a Christian kingdom in distress. To receive the relics, Louis commissioned Peter of Montreuil to build Sainte-Chapelle. With all his deep piety, Louis was no tool of the clergy. He recognized their human shortcomings and chastised them with good example and open rebuke. He restricted the powers of ecclesiastical courts and asserted the authority of the law over all citizens, lay or clerical. In 1268 he issued the first pragmatic sanction, limiting the power of the papacy in ecclesiastical appointments and taxation in France. We will that no one may raise or collect in any manner exactions or assessments of money which have been imposed by the court of Rome unless the cause be reasonable, pious, most urgent, and recognized by our express and spontaneous consent and by that of the church of our realm. Despite his monastic propensities, Louis always remained the king, and preserved the royal majesty even when, as Fra Salimbene describes him, spare and slender, having the face of an angel and a countenance full of grace, he appeared on foot in pilgrim's habit and with pilgrim's staff to begin his first crusade in 1248. Queen Blanche, whom he left, despite her sixty years as regent with the fullest powers, wept as they parted. Most sweet fair son, fair tender son, I shall never see you more. He was captured in Egypt, and was held for a ransom that Blanche with great difficulty raised and paid. But when, defeated and humbled, he returned to France in 1252, he found his mother dead. In 1270, weak with illness, he set out again, this time for Tunisia. It was not so quixotic an enterprise as its failure made it out to be. Louis had allowed his brother, Charles of Anjou, to lead a French army into Italy not only to check German domination there, but also in the hope that Sicily might be made a base for a French invasion of Tunisia. Shortly after reaching Tunisia, the great crusader, older in body than in years, died of dysentery. Twenty-seven years later the Church canonized him. Generations and centuries looked back to his reign as the golden age of France, and wondered why an inscrutable providence would not send them his like again. He was a Christian king. 3. Philip the Fair France was strengthened by the Crusades, in which she took a leading part. The long reigns of Philip Augustus and Louis IX gave her government continuity and stability, while England suffered the negligent Richard I, the reckless John, and the incompetent Henry III, and while Germany disintegrated in the wars between the emperors and the popes. By 1300 France was the strongest power in Europe. Philip IV, from 1285 to 1314, was called Le Bel, for his handsome figure and face, not for his subtle statecraft and pitiless audacity. His aims were vast, to bring all classes, nobles and clergy as well as townsmen and serfs, under the direct law and control of the king, to base French growth on commerce and industry, rather than on agriculture, and to extend the boundaries of France to the Atlantic, the Pyrenees, the Mediterranean, the Alps, and the Rhine. He chose his aides and counselors not from the great ecclesiastics and barons who had served French kings for four centuries past, but from the lawyer class that came to him impregnate with the imperial ideas of Roman law. Pierre Flotte and Guillaume de Nogaret were brilliant intellects careless of morals and precedents. Under their guidance, Philip rebuilt the legal structure of France, replaced feudal with royal law, overcame his foes by shrewd diplomacy, and in the end broke the power of the papacy and made the Pope in effect a prisoner of France. He tried to detach Guienne from England, but found Edward I too strong for him. He won Champagne, Brie, and Navarre by marriage, and bought with hard cash Chartres, Franche-Comté, the Lyonnais, and part of Lorraine. Always needing money, he spent half in raising funds. He commuted for money the military obligations of the barons to the crown. He repeatedly debased the coinage and insisted on taxes being paid in bullion or in honest coin. He exiled the Jews and the Lombards and destroyed the Templars to confiscate their wealth. He forbade the export of precious metal from his realm. He laid heavy taxes upon exports, imports, and sales, and a war tax of a penny upon every livre of private wealth in France. Finally, without consulting the Pope, he taxed the wealth of the Church, which now owned a quarter of the land of France. The results belong to the story of Boniface VIII. When the old Pope, broken by the struggle, died, Philip's agents and money secured the election of a Frenchman as Clement V, and the removal of the papacy to Avignon. Never had any layman won so great a victory over the Church. Henceforth, in France, 
The lawyers ruled the priests. The Grand Master of the Templars, as he went to the stake, predicted that Philip would follow him within a year. It so befell. And not only Philip, but Clement, too, died in 1314. The triumphant king aged only forty-six. The French people had admired his tenacity and courage, and had upheld him against Boniface, but they cursed his memory as the most grasping monarch in their history. France was almost broken by his victory. His debased currency disordered the national economy, High rents and prices impoverished the people, taxation retarded industry, and the banishment of the Lombards and the Jews crippled the sinews of commerce and ruined the great fairs. The prosperity that had mounted under Louis the Saint declined under the master of every trick of law and diplomatic craft. Three sons of Philip mounted the throne and descended into the grave within fourteen years of his death. None of them left sons to inherit his power. Charles IV, who died in 1328, left daughters, but the old Salic law was invoked to refuse them the crown. The nearest male heir of the royal family was Philip of Valois, nephew of Philip the Fair. With his accession the direct line of the Capetian kings ended, and the rule of the house of Valois began. A coup d'oeil of France in this period shows remarkable advances in economy, law, education, literature, and art. Serfdom was rapidly disappearing as the growth of urban industry lured men from the farms. Paris in 1314 had some 200,000 inhabitants, France some 22 million. Brunetto Latini, fleeing from the political violence of Florence, marveled at the peace and security that reigned in the streets of Paris under Louis the Ninth, the busy handicrafts and commerce of the towns, the fruitful fields and vineyards of the peasant countryside around the capital. The rise of the business and professional classes, almost rivaling the nobility and wealth, compelled their representation in the Etats Généraux, or States General, which Philip IV summoned to Paris in 1302 to give him moral and financial support in his conflict with Boniface. Such general assemblies of the three estates, or classes, nobles, clergy, commons, were called only in emergencies, in 1302, 1308, 1314, etc., and were cleverly guided by the lawyers who served the king as a conseil d'état, or council of state. The Parliament of Paris, which took form under Louis the Ninth was not a representative assembly, but a group of some ninety-four lawyers and clerics appointed by the king, and meeting once or twice a year to serve as a supreme court. Its ordonnance, built up a body of national law based upon Roman rather than Frank codes, and giving the monarchy the full support of the classical legal tradition. The intellectual excitement of the age of Philip the Fourth is preserved for us in the political treatises of one of his supporters, Pierre Dubois, who lived from 1255 to 1312, a lawyer who represented Coutances in the States General of 1302. In a Supplication du Peuple de France au Roi contre le Pape Boniface, an appeal of the people of France to the king against Pope Boniface of 1304, and in a tract on the recovery of the Holy Land of 1306, Dubois threw out suggestions that revealed the sharp division that now separated the legal from the ecclesiastical mind in France. The church, said Dubois, should be disendowed, should no longer receive financial support from the state. The French church should be separated from Rome, the papacy should be divorced from all temporal power, and the authority of the state should be supreme. Philip should be made emperor of a united Europe, with Constantinople as his capital. An international court should be set up to adjudicate the quarrels of nations, and an economic boycott should be declared against any Christian nation that warred upon another. A school of Oriental studies should be established at Rome. Women should have the same educational opportunities and political rights as men. It was the age of the troubadours in Provence, of the Trouvères in the north, of the Chanson de Roland and other Chansons de Geste, of Aucassin et Nicolette, and the Romain de la Rose, of the first outstanding French historians, Villardouin and Joinville. In this period great universities were organized in Paris, Orléans, Angers, Toulouse, and Montpellier. It began with Roselin and Abelard, and culminated in the zenith of the scholastic philosophy. It was the age of the Gothic ecstasy, of the majestic cathedrals of Saint-Denis, Chartres, Notre-Dame, Amiens, and Reims, and of Gothic sculpture in its most spiritual perfection. Frenchmen were forgivably proud of their country, their capital, and their culture. A national unifying patriotism was replacing the provincialism of the feudal era. Already, as in the Chanson de Roland, 
Men spoke lovingly of la douce France, sweet France. It was in France, as in Italy, the climax of Christian civilization. 12. Spain, 1096-1285 The Christian reconquest of Spain proceeded as rapidly as the fraternal chaos of the Spanish kings would permit. The popes gave the name and privileges of crusaders to Christians who would help drive back the Moors in Spain. Some Templars came from France to help the cause. And three Spanish military religious orders, the Knights of Calatrava, of Santiago, of Alcantara, were formed in the twelfth century. In 1118, Alfonso I of Aragon captured Saragossa. In 1195, the Christians were defeated at Alarcos, but in 1212 they almost wiped out the main Almohad army at Las Navas de Tolosa. The victory was decisive. Moorish resistance broke down, and one by one the Moslem citadels fell. Cordova in 1236, Valencia in 1238, Seville in 1248, and Cadiz in 1250. Thereafter the Reconquista halted for two centuries to allow time for the wars of the kings. When Alfonso VIII of Castile was defeated at Alarcos, the kings of Leon and Navarre, who had promised to go to his help, invaded his kingdom, and Alfonso had to make peace with the infidels to protect himself against the infidelity of the Christians. Fernando III, from 1217 to 1252, reunited Leon and Castile, pushed the Catholic frontier to Granada, made Seville his capital, the great mosque, his cathedral, the Alcazar, his residence. The church considered him a bastard at his birth and made him a saint after his death. His son, Alfonso X, from 1252 to 1284, was an excellent scholar and an irresolute king. Attracted by the Moorish learning that he found in Seville, Alfonso el Sabio, the wise, braved the bigots by hiring Arab and Jewish as well as Christian scholars to translate Moslem works into Latin for the instruction of Europe. He established a school of astronomy whose Alphonsan tables of heavenly bodies and movements became standard for Christian astronomers. He organized a corps of historians who wrote under his name a history of Spain and a vast and general history of the world. He composed some 450 poems, some in Castilian, some in Galician Portuguese. Many were set to music and survive as one of the most substantial monuments of medieval song. His literary passion overflowed in books written or commissioned by him on drafts, chess, dice, stones, music, navigation, alchemy, and philosophy. Apparently he ordered a translation of the Bible to be made directly from the Hebrew into Castilian. With him the Castilian language assumed the preeminence from which it has since ruled the literary life of Spain. He was in effect the founder of Spanish and Portuguese literature, of Spanish historiography, of Spanish scientific terminology. He tarnished a brilliant career by intriguing to secure the throne of the Holy Roman Empire. He spent much Spanish treasure in the attempt. He sought to replenish his coffers by raising taxes and debasing the coinage. He was deposed in favor of his son, survived his downfall by two years, and died a broken man. Aragon rose to prominence through the marriage of its queen Petronilla to Count Ramon Berenguer of Barcelona in 1137. Aragon thereby acquired Catalonia, including the greatest of Spanish ports. Pedro II, from 1196 to 1213, brought the new kingdom to prosperity by protecting with vigorously enforced law the security of harbors, markets, and roads. He made his court at Barcelona the gay and amorous center of Spanish chivalry and troubadours, and saved his soul, and ensured his title, by presenting Aragon to Innocent III as a feudal fief. His son, Jaime, or James I, from 1213 to 1276, was five when Pedro died in battle. The Aragonese nobles seized the opportunity to renew their feudal independence, but James took the reins at ten and soon brought the nobles under royal discipline. Still a youth of twenty, he captured the commercially strategic Balearic Islands from the Moors, from 1229 to 1235, and regained from them Valencia and Alicante. In 1265, in a chivalric gesture of Spanish unity, he conquered Murcia from the Moors and presented it to the King of Castile. Wiser than Alfonso the Wise, he made himself the most powerful Spanish monarch of his century, the rival of Frederick II and Louis IX. His shrewd intelligence and unscrupulous courage likened him to Frederick, but his loose morality, his many divorces, his ruthless wars and occasional brutality discouraged comparison with St. Louis. He conspired to seize southwestern France 
but the patient Louis outplayed him, though yielding to him Montpellier. In his old age, James plotted to conquer Sicily as a bastion of strategy and a haven of commerce, and to make the western Mediterranean a Spanish sea. But the realization of his dream was left to his son. Pedro III, from 1276 to 1285, married a daughter of Frederick's son Manfred, king of Sicily, and felt entitled to that island when Charles of Anjou seized it with the blessings of the Pope. Pedro renounced the papal suzerainty over Aragon, accepted excommunication, and sailed off to fight for Sicily. As in England and France, this period saw in Spain both the rise and the decline of feudalism. The nobles began by almost ignoring the central power. They and the clergy were exempt from taxation, which fell the more heavily upon cities and trade. But they ended by submitting to kings armed with their own troops, supported by the revenues and militia of the towns, and endowed with the prestige of a reviving Roman law that assumed absolute monarchy as an axiom of government. At the beginning of the period there was no Spanish law. There were separate law codes for each state, and for each class in each state. Fernando III began, Alfonso X completed, a new system of Castilian law, which from its seven divisions came to be known as the Siete Partidas, or Laws of the Seven Parts, from 1260 to 1265 one of the most complete and important codes in legal history. Based on the laws of the Spanish Visigoths, but remodeled to accord with Justinian's institutes, the Siete Partidas proved too advanced for their age. For seventy years they were largely ignored. But in 1338 they became the actual law of Castile, and in 1492 of all Spain. A like code was introduced into Aragon by James I, in 1283, Aragon promulgated an influential code of commercial and maritime law, and established at Valencia, and later at Barcelona and in Majorca, courts of the Consulate of the Sea. Spain led the medieval world in developing free cities and representative institutions. Seeking the support of the cities against the nobles, the kings gave charters of self-government to many towns. Municipal independence became a passion in Spain. Little towns demanded their liberty from larger ones, or from the nobles, the church, the king. When they succeeded, they raised their own gallows in the marketplace as a symbol of their freedom. Barcelona in 1258 was ruled by a council of two hundred members, of whom a majority represented industry or trade. For a time the towns were sovereign to the point of independently waging wars against the Moors or one another, but also they formed hermandades, brotherhoods, for mutual action or security. In 1295, when the nobles tried to subdue the communes, thirty-four towns formed the Hermandad de Castillo, pledged themselves to a common defense, and raised a joint army. This brotherhood, having overcome the nobles, supervised and checked the officials of the king, and passed laws for a common observance of the member towns, which sometimes numbered a hundred. It had long been the custom of Spanish kings to call on occasion an assembly of nobles and clergy, one such gathering, meeting in 1137, received for the first time the name Cortes, or Courts. In 1188, at the Cortes of León, businessmen from the towns were included, probably the earliest instance of representative political institutions in Christian Europe. In this historic congress, the king promised not to make war or peace or issue any decree without the consent of the Cortes. In Castile, the first such Cortes of nobles, clergy and bourgeoisie, met in 1250, forty-five years before the model parliament of Edward I. The Cortes did not directly legislate, but it formulated petitions to the king, and its power of the purse often persuaded his assent. A decree of the Cortes of Catalonia in 1283, accepted by the king of Aragon, ruled that thereafter no national legislation should be issued without the consent of the citizens, or cives. Another provision required the king to summon the Cortes annually, these enactments anticipated by over a quarter of a century similar pronouncements, in 1311 and 1322, of the English Parliament. Furthermore, the Cortes appointed members from each social class to a junta, or union, to keep watch, in the intervals between the sessions of the Cortes, over the administration of the laws and funds that it had voted. The problem of government in Spain was complicated by divisive mountains impeding the wide enforcement of a common law. The uneven terrain, the dry plateaus, and the periodic devastations of war discouraged agriculture, and made Spain largely a grazing land for cattle and sheep. The fine sheep herds fed thousands of looms in the towns, and Spain maintained its ancient high reputation for the quality of its wool. 
Internal trade was harassed by difficulties of transport and diversities of weights, measures, and currencies. But foreign trade grew in the ports of Barcelona, Tarragona, Valencia, Seville, and Cadiz. Catalan merchants were everywhere, and in 1282 the merchants of Castile held a position in Bruges rivaled only by the Hanseatic League. Merchants and manufacturers became the chief financial support of the crown. The urban proletariat organized itself into guilds or gremios, but these were strictly controlled by the kings, and the working classes suffered economic exploitation without political representation. Most of the industrial workers were either Jews or Mudejares, Muslims in Christian Spain. The Jews prospered in Aragon and Castile. They shared actively in the intellectual life of the two kingdoms. Many of them were rich merchants, but at the end of this period they were subjected to increasing restrictions. The Mudejares were allowed freedom of worship and considerable self-government. They too included many rich merchants, and a few found entry to the royal courts. Their craftsmen strongly influenced Spanish architecture, woodwork, and metalwork to the Mudahar style, the use of Moorish forms and themes in Christian art. Alfonso VI, in a Catholic moment, called himself Emperador de los Dos Cultos, Emperor of the Two Faiths. But the Mudaharis in general had to wear a distinctive garb, live in a separate section of the city, and bear especially heavy taxation. Ultimately, the wealth aggregated by their industry and commercial skill excited the envy of the majority race. In 1247, James I ordered their expulsion from Aragon. Over 100,000 of them left, taking their technical skills with them, and Aragonese industry thereafter declined. The partial absorption of Moslem culture into Spanish civilization, the stimulus of victory over an ancient enemy, the growth of industry and wealth, and of manners and tastes, stirred the mental life of Spain. The thirteenth century saw the establishment of six universities in Spain. Alfonso II of Aragon, from 1162 to 1196, was the first Spanish troubadour. Soon there were hundreds, and they not only wrote poetry, they developed the ceremonies of the church into secular plays, opening a path to the triumphs of Lope de Vega and Calderon. To this period belongs the Cid, the national epic of Spain. Better than all these were the music, songs, and dances that flowed from the hearts of the people in their homes and streets, and graduated into the splendor and pageantry of the royal courts. The first recorded bullfight in the modern style was given at Avila, in 1107, to adorn a wedding feast. By 1300 it was a common sport in the cities of Spain. At the same time the French knights who came to help against the Moors brought the ideas and tournaments of chivalry. Respect for women, or for a man's exclusive property in a woman, was made a point of honor as vital as a man's pride in his courage and integrity. The duel of honor became a part of Spanish life. The mixture of European and Afro-Semitic blood, of Occidental and Oriental culture, of Syrian and Persian motives with Gothic art, of Roman hardness with Eastern sentiment, generated the Spanish character and made Spanish civilization in the thirteenth century a unique and colorful element in the European scene. 13. Portugal, 1095 in the year 1095, Count Henry of Burgundy, a crusading knight in Spain, so pleased Alfonso VI of Castile and Leon that the king gave him a daughter, Teresa, in marriage, and included in her dowry as a fief a county of Leon named Portugal. The territory had been won from Moslem Spain only thirty-one years before, and south of the Mondego River the Moors still ruled. Count Henry felt uncomfortable as anything less than a king. From their marriage he and his wife plotted to make their fief an independent state. When Henry died in 1112, Teresa continued to labor for independence. She taught her nobles and vassals to think in terms of national liberty. She encouraged her cities to fortify themselves and study the arts of war. She led her soldiers in person on campaign after campaign, and between wars she surrounded herself with musicians, poets, and lovers. She was defeated, captured, released, and restored to her fief. She lavished funds upon an illicit love, was deposed, went into exile with her lover, and died in poverty in 1130. It was through her inspiration and preparations that her son, Afonso I. Enriquez, from 1128 to 1185, achieved her aims. Alfonso VII of Castile promised to recognize him as sovereign ruler of any land that he might conquer from the moors below the Douro River. With all the reckless bravery of his father and the spirit and pertinacity of his mother, 
Afonso Enriquez attacked the Moors, defeated them at Urique in 1139, and proclaimed himself king of Portugal. The hierarchy persuaded the two kings to submit the matter to Pope Innocent II, who decided in favor of Castile. Afonso Enriquez reversed this decision by offering his new kingdom to the papacy as a fief. Alexander III accepted it and recognized him as king of Portugal in 1143 on condition of annual tribute to the See of Rome. Afonso Enriquez resumed his wars with the Moors, captured Santarum and Lisbon, and extended his rule to the Tagus. Under Afonso III, from 1248 to 1279, Portugal reached its present mainland limits, and Lisbon, strategically placed at the mouth of the Tagus, became its port and capital in 1263. An old legend said that Ulysses Odysseus had founded the city and given it its ancient name Ulyssipo, which the carelessness of tongues transformed into Olisipo and Lisboa. The last years of Afonso II were embittered by civil war with his son, Denise, who wondered why his father took so long to die. From this dubious beginning, Denise moved into a long and beneficent reign, from 1279 to 1325. Peace with Leon and Castile was achieved by a marital alliance. Strife with another heir to the throne was averted by the mediation of Isabel, Denise's saintly queen. Renouncing the glories of war, Denis devoted himself to the economic and cultural development of his kingdom. He founded schools of agriculture, taught his people improved methods of husbandry, planted trees to check erosion, helped commerce, built ships and cities, organized a Portuguese navy, and negotiated a commercial treaty with England. So he earned the title fondly given him by his subjects, Rey Labrador, the Worker King. He was an industrious administrator and a just judge. He supported poets and scholars, and himself wrote the best poetry of his nation and time. Through him Portuguese ceased to be the Galician dialect and became a literary language. In his pastoreias he gave literary form to the songs of the people, and at his court troubadours were encouraged to sing the joys and pains of love. Denise himself was a connoisseur in women, and preferred his bastards to his one legitimate son. When this son rebelled and raised an army to unseat his father, St. Isabel, who had lived apart from the merry court of the king, rode between the hostile forces, proposed to be the first victim of their violence, and chained her husband and her son to peace in 1323. Chapter 26 Pre-Renaissance Italy, 1057-1308 1. Norman Sicily, 1090-1194 It is remarkable to how many different environments, from Scotland to Sicily, the Normans adapted themselves, with what violent energy they aroused sleeping regions and peoples, and how completely in a few centuries they were absorbed by their subjects and disappeared from history. For a turbulent century they ruled southern Italy as successors to the Byzantine power, and Sicily as heirs to the Saracens. In 1060, Roger Guiscard, with a tiny band of buccaneers, began the invasion of the island. By 1091, its conquest was complete. In 1085, Norman Italy accepted Roger as its ruler, and when he died in 1101, the two Sicilies, the island and southern Italy, were already a power in the politics of Europe. Control of the Straits of Messina and of the fifty miles between Sicily and Africa gave the Normans a decisive commercial and military advantage. Amalfi, Salerno, and Palermo became the foci of an active trade with all Mediterranean ports, including Moslem centers in Tunisia and Spain. Sicily, now a papal fief, replaced Mohammedan mosques with resplendent Christian churches, and in southern Italy Greek prelates gave way to Roman Catholic priests. Roger II, from 1101 to 1154, made Palermo his capital, extended his rule in Italy to Naples and Capua, and in 1130 expanded his title from count to king. He had all the ambition and courage, resourcefulness and subtlety of his uncle, Robert Guiscard, so alert in thought and industrious in action that Idrisi, his Moslem biographer, said of him that he accomplished more asleep than other men awake. Opposed by the popes, who feared his encroachment upon the papal states, by the German emperors, who resented his annexation of the Abruzzi, by the Byzantines, who dreamed of regaining southern Italy, and by the Moslems of Africa, who longed to recapture Sicily, he fought them all, sometimes several of them at once, and emerged with his kingdom greater than before, and with new acquisitions in Tunis, Safax, Bonn, and Tripoli. 
He made use of the intelligent Saracens, Greeks, and Jews of Sicily to organize a better civil service and administrative bureaucracy than any other nation in Europe had at the time. He allowed the feudal organization of agriculture in Sicily, but kept his barons in check with the royal court, whose law covered every class. He enriched the economy of Sicily by bringing in silk weavers from Greece and furthered commerce by competent protection of life, travel, and property. He allowed religious freedom and cultural autonomy to Moslems, Jews, and Greek Catholics, opened career to all talent, himself wore Moslem garb, liked Moslem morals, and lived as a Latin king in an Oriental court. His kingdom was for a generation the richest and most civilized state in Europe, and he was the most enlightened ruler of his age. Without him, Frederick II, a still greater king, would have been impossible. The King Roger's Book of Idrisi suggests the prosperity of Norman Sicily. A hardy, busy peasantry covered the rich soil with crops and kept the cities fed. They lived in hovels and suffered the usual exploitation of the useful by the clever, but their life was dignified with a colorful piety and brightened with festivals and song. Every season of the agricultural year had its dances and chants, and vintage time brought bacchanalian feasts that bound ancient Saturnalia with modern carnival. Even to the forest there remained love and folk songs ranging from license and satire to lyrics of purest tenderness. In the town of San Marco, said Idrisi, the air is perfumed by the violets growing everywhere. Messina, Catania, Syracuse flourished again as in Carthaginian, Greek, or Roman days. Palermo seemed to Idrisi the finest city in the world. It turns the heads of all who see it. It has buildings of such beauty that travelers flock to it, drawn by the fame of the marvels of architecture, the exquisite workmanship, the admirable conceptions of art. The central street was a panorama of towering palaces, high and superb hostels, churches, baths, shops of great merchants. All travelers say outright that there are nowhere buildings more marvelous than those of Palermo, nor any site more exquisite than her pleasure gardens. And the Moslem traveler Ibn Jubayr, seeing Palermo in 1184, exclaimed, A stupendous city! The palaces of the king encircle it as a necklace clasps the throat of a maiden with well-filled bosom. Visitors were struck by the variety of languages spoken in Palermo, the peaceful mingling of races and faiths, the neighborly confusion of churches, synagogues, and mosques, the elegantly dressed citizens, the busy streets, the quiet gardens, the comfortable homes. In those homes and palaces, the arts of the East served the conquerors from the West. This book is continued on Cassette 13, Side 1.